Leeds Humanities Research Bites is a project of the Leeds Humanities Research Institute in the University of Leeds. I'm Matthew Trahan, Director of the Institute, and in this series of short recordings I'll be discussing with researchers from across the Faculty of Arts at Leeds recent publications. So I'm very pleased to be here with Professor Greg Raddick talking about his book uh, The Simian Tongue, The Long Debate About Animal Language that was published by the University of Chicago Press. Um, the book won the Suzanne J. Levinson Prize from the History of Science Society for the best book in the life sciences and natural history. So congratulations on that, Greg. Thank you. Um, it's a wonderful achievement. Um, the book engages with the question of how debates around animal language took shape following Darwin's work um, in the late 19th century and right the way through to the present day. Um, So I thought, Greg, perhaps we could begin by talking about one of the key concepts or pairs of concepts, really, that that shapes the story that your book tells, which is the idea of a contest between two things, Morgan's canon, on the one hand, and Garner's phonograph, two very important ideas. I wonder if you could maybe say a bit about those two ideas, what, what they refer to, and then how that contest between the two of them shapes the debate over animal language. Sure. Well, let me take Garner's phonograph first. Uh, Richard Garner was an American born in Virginia in 1848, and he's in a lot of ways the hero of the first part of the book. He's also where the book really started for me. It was discovering Garner and his studies in animal language that led me ultimately to write the book. And he was not trained as a scientist, but like so many people, he got fascinated by the debates in the 1860s and 70s and beyond over Darwinism, and in particular over human human evolution. And the outstanding question for a lot of people in making up their minds about whether the Darwinian theory was true was about language. Could the Darwinians explain human language? Could they give a plausible account of the emergence, naturally, of human language? And it seems so challenging, uh, not least because animal communication seemed to be so utterly different and so utterly impoverished compared with human language. How to fill that gap? So Garner took it upon himself to do it. And in around about 1890, he thought he saw how. And his great insight was to see that a new invention, Thomas Edison's phonograph, uh, held the key to a new kind of experiment. And so Garner created uh, a new method for translating, as he saw it, animal language. And the basic idea is what came to be called playback. So the uh, animal utters its cry, or whatever it might be, It's recorded in in that day on wax cylinders. And then, and this is the crucial bit, the recordings are played back to the animals and their behavior in response is observed. And by doing this, Garner reckoned that he could work out what these calls or cries mean Mm. to the animals. Mm. And so he started, as you would, uh, as a Darwinian, with monkeys. Mm. And there were a lot of monkeys around in Garner's America. He started at the zoo at the Smithsonian, and he judged it a success. It wasn't easy work, but to his own satisfaction, at least, and to a number of others, he'd managed to begin translating what he called the simian tongue, uh, which gave me the title Mm -hmm. for my book. So round about 1891, he began publishing on this work, immediately finds himself acclaimed, publishes a book on it in 1892 called The Speech of Monkeys, and then sails off from America to Africa via England with the aim of taking his research to the next step. Mm. So he'd worked with monkeys up to that point. Mm. But his hope was that in Africa he'd get a chance to work with gorillas and chimpanzees. And there, with his phonograph, to take down the missing links of language. And he wasn't going to take any chances. He was going to sit in an iron cage in the jungle in the French Congo, uh, Mm. uh, what's now uh, Gabon. Uh, And and there he was going to capture on wax cylinders the links between the lowest human language as he thought of it and and the rest of the animal uh, kingdom. Mm. So that was the plan. That was about 1892. That's Garner and his phonograph. He is not at all well remembered now within psychology. That's a big contrast with Morgan, Mm. Conway Lloyd Morgan, uh, 
was a psychologist and geologist based at what's now Bristol University. Uh, he's reckoned to be, by, uh, from a number of perspectives, the first scientific psychologist uh, in Britain. He was the first FRS uh, mm. in, in that science. And it, throughout the 1880s, he took the science of animal minds, comparative psychology, to be his sort of specialist subject. And he wasn't at all impressed with the quality of work in that field. He felt it suffered from anthropomorphism, so from people observing animals do clever things and then imputing to them great powers of reasoning. Mm -hmm. Whereas Morgan reckoned often if you observed an animal carefully, you would see that the, uh, the path it took to becoming so clever wasn't the exercise of reason, but just trial and error. Mm -hmm. So a dog learns to open a door Mm. Not by figuring out how the door works, but just by rubbing up against it. Mm. And eventually it will find something that works, and that brings pleasure, mm. and that stamps that motion in. Mm. So Morgan comes to animal mind questions with this enormous skepticism and a belief that to be truly scientific about the animal mind is to be very dubious mm. about claims of animal reason. And he formulates this attitude as a rule of method, which mm. he calls his canon mm. of method. And it roughly says, thou shalt not attribute to the animal mind more than is absolutely necessary uh, to explain animal behavior. Mm. And in practice, it meant always prefer trial and error explanations, unless you have a really good reason right. not to. Right. And it turned out, in a lovely way from my point of view as a historian, mm -hmm. that these two almost met. Because uh, in 1892, in August, Garner is en route to the French Congo, but he passes through Britain, and he's invited to speak at the British Association for the Advancement of Science meeting in Edinburgh, mm -hmm. and to tell the assembled scientists about his work with the phonograph. Mm -hmm. At that very meeting, Conway Lord Morgan announced his canon for the first time. Uh, and what I found was that Morgan, at least, was paying attention to Garner to such an extent that in 1893, while Garner's off in the French Congo, Morgan writes something in which he more or less says, uh, here's what I think one ought to do in studying animal minds, but I could be wrong. And if we find out tomorrow that animals do have language and therefore do have reason, well, that's what science is like. You mm. find out new things and change your mind. Mm. So there was a moment when Morgan's canon was vulnerable to Garner's phonograph. That's great. Yeah, that's fascinating. And then on, on that trip to the French Congo, of course, Garner, there's a great chapter in your book which explores this great scandal that engulfed Garner, really, around that trip to the French Congo. Could you say yeah. a little bit about what that scandal was sure. and how it well, developed? Well, it, it all went rather badly wrong uh, for Richard Garner, which is why you know, nobody remembers him, but everyone remembers Conway Lloyd Morgan. And uh, Garner came back from the French Congo and in early 1894 began lecturing on his experiences mm -hmm. and what he'd found and what he'd learned uh, in Britain. And he began to be chased by a newspaper called Truth, which was something like the private eye of its day, and had a very colorful editor, an MP named Henry Labouchere. And Labouchere gradually led on that uh, Truth had informants there in the French Congo who had been watching Richard Garner and who had rather a different story to tell than Garner was telling about just how he'd spent his time mm -hmm. in the French Congo. So this all dialed up uh, for several months, insinuations counter-insinuations, and finally it came clear quite what the accusations were. The accusations were that Garner, far from sitting in his cage in the jungle, trying to learn the truth about uh, apes and their language, in fact had found the jungle so frightening and so full of mosquitoes and, and other nastiness that he, after about three days, fled to the safety of a local mission. And he spent the rest of his time there at the mission house, drinking the brothers' claret, uh, eating their food, and basically taking notes on their own observations about, about apes. And then he'd come back and try to retail these as his own. So he was a coward, he was a fraud, uh, 
uh, and he was a deadbeat because he didn't even pay his bills mm. for the claret. And you have some con- provisional conclusions, at least, about what you think actually happened in, on that expedition, don't you? Yeah, I stick my neck out a little yeah. bit uh, uh, in, in the book because uh, I had the pleasure of working with Garner's papers mm. at the Smithsonian in Washington. And there I found a notebook which was more or less entitled What Really Happened <laughs> in the French Congo, mm. uh, my version mm. by Richard Garner. And he tells an incredibly detailed, uh, fantastical, but also from a certain point of view, plausible, mm. humanly plausible story about going to the French Congo and really thinking that he was just going to be the only guy there and finding to his amazement that he was in a French colony full of people who had rules and who insisted that he wait for a month before he was able to go out there and and how on his on the steamer out he met this priest and the priest said well if you're going to be studying apes in the way you are you must come around the mission Mm. have some of our food drink Mm. or wine that he he portrays the priest as rather passive aggressive Mm -hmm. uh, in in both insisting that he must get on with his studies but always being around and Mm. inviting him and and, uh, uh, I go into more detail in in the book but Garner ultimately concluded that he was a victim Mm. of Catholic prejudice Mm. against Darwinian science Mm. Uh, the priest more or less told him that he had to do everything in his power Mm. to thwart Garner Mm. and his enterprise because as a Catholic priest, it was his duty Mm. to keep the Darwinian science from spreading and that having failed to fully block Garner's uh, work in Africa, he then resorted to blackening his name in the press back home. So... Uh, that's now. I, I do try to leave it up to the reader somewhat to to make up uh, to make up minds, but uh, I did try to give Garner's version as full a ride as mm. I could. Mm. So, if we move on to the to the early twentieth century, as your book does, um, the question of animal language there becomes a little bit more associated with um, psychology and lab experimentation. Could you say a little bit about how that developed? Well, one of the things I've, I tried to do in the book in taking the story forward uh, was to ask, well, what happened to Garner's kinds of experiments? Because there was huge excitement about them, mm-hmm. not least within the scientific community in the 1890s. Why did they disappear? And I think that part of the answer is to do with this scandal that uh, settles around Garner, uh, which we've just discussed. But... The other part, and in some ways from the historian's point of view, a a more instructive part of the story, is to do with the way that disciplines in the sciences form and change Mm -hmm. over time. And the period 1890 to 1920 is the period in which two sciences bearing on the question of the origin of human language in the relations between animal communication and human language come into being in Mm. something like their modern form. Mm. One is psychology, and the other is anthropology. Mm. And and I try to both follow out the personal story, uh, Garner's relations with individual psychologists and anthropologists from the 1890s until his death in 1920, uh, but to do so in a way that brings out these larger disciplinary changes, such that by about 1920, no professionally ambitious psychologist or anthropologist would dream of doing Garner's kind of mm. research. Mm. That is to say, going out into the jungles mm. with a phonograph in the attempt to record and even translate mm. the instinctive communication of animals. And in the case of psychology, just to focus on, on that side, uh, it's a story of a narrowing which takes place in part because uh, an experiment is devised which just beautifully fits the needs of tyro psychologists Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's developed around animal learning by a man named Edward Thorndike Mm -hmm. who was hugely impressed with Morgan Mm -hmm. and Morgan's canon and hugely impressed with the idea that animal learning is the right subject for psychology So Thorndike invents what he calls a puzzle box. And this is basically, in his case, a crate 
with a door. And he had put a hungry animal inside and then start the clock and see how long it took the animal to get out of the box and there'd be some piece of food outside to tempt the mm. animal. And then do it again. Mm. And with each trial, it would take less time for the animal to get out. And he graphed these results with uh, time on the y-axis and number of trials on the x-axis. And that's the origin of the learning curve, mm. which has passed into the language. Mm. Uh, but that's where it starts. Mm. So just after Garner's there in the jungles, Thorndike at Harvard invents this new way of studying the animal mind, which is focused very tightly on animal learning. It's quantitative, it's experimental, and it presumes very little about animal consciousness. Mm. Thorndike thought animals were conscious, mm. but he also thought that the most productive way to study them was to act as if they weren't and to treat right. them right. as trial and error machines. Mm. And from there, his methodology just spread. Mm. And along with it, especially with the rise of something called behaviorism, mm. this uh, skepticism about the contents of animal minds and their capacity to reason mm. just became kind of industrial strength. Mm. Uh, and, and this is part of what leads to generations of psychology students who, when they ask themselves, what do I want to study next, inevitably think about rats in mazes mm. rather than apes in the jungle. Mm. Mm. And then in the second half of the 20th century, things changed somewhat methodologically. Um, and you take the career of Peter Marler as a, as a case study um, to try and help understand how the debate unfolds and how the methodologies change and develop. Why, why Peter Marler? Why was his work so important? Well, I uh, understood only gradually how important Marler was for my own story. Uh, one of the reasons that I was attracted to Garner's work in the first place was that I knew about modern studies, which sounded an awful lot mm. like what he had done mm. uh, in uh, translating the Simian tongue, worked on with vervet monkeys in Kenya, showing by way of modern playback studies that they had alarm calls which were referentially specific, which informed other vervets, not just that a predator was present, but which kind of predator, a leopard or an eagle or a python. Mm. And as I wrote the book, I persuaded myself at least that the story really wanted expansion up to those experiments, mm. which took place in the 1970s mm. and which were sponsored by Peter Marler. Mm -hmm. Now, by that time, Marler was a grand research professor at mm. Rockefeller University. Mm. He was the leading expert on animal vocalizations and their experimental study. Uh, his main focus was birds and birdsong, and many biology students still meet his work in their textbooks uh, by way of his uh, studies of how instinct and learning interact in how birds learn their songs. But he also got interested in apes and monkeys. Uh, and so I found that by tracing his career and the kind of intellectual odyssey that he undertook from the 1950s forward, uh, I was able both to uh, understand how those experiments, those Garner-like experiments, mm. came back again, mm. even though they comprehensively disappeared mm. from the scientific record and memory mm. you know, from about the 1890s. So how they came to be reinvented, but also to throw new light on all kinds of aspects of the biological and the human sciences mm. that end up inter intersecting mm. in Peter Marler's career, because he'd studied, he was the first graduate student in ethology. Uh, at Cambridge. And ethology is a science invented very much in reaction against the psychology that developed in the wake of Thorndike's puzzle boxes. Mm -hmm. So ethology was that branch of biology which would take seriously the complexity mm -hmm. of an animal's biological life mm -hmm. and therefore the complexity of instincts uh, uh, within it. So it didn't just presume that learning was all the animal had. Rather, one of the great topics was the interplay mm -hmm. of instinct and learning. So Marler's there at the beginning with ethology. Mm -hmm. 
but he takes it in very distinctive directions. And he turns out just to have been a wonderfully open-minded scientist, mm. someone that other ethologists look to as, as unusually mm. uh, um, generous mm. I- intellectually. So someone who thought he could learn from linguists, from cognitive scientists, from others. And so as I watch him get engaged uh, through the book in debates about the origin of language, mm. in relations between communication mm. and information and language, mm. in questions about animal vocalizations in particular as emotional or representational, mm. Mm. Uh, I found I was able to teach myself at least uh, uh, quite a lot of new things about how linguistic psychology mm. related sciences mm. developed through the latter part of the 20th century. Mm. Mm. And I, I, I suppose in common with Ghana, really, there's, there's a big impact outside of the academy as well. I mean, it's one of the things your book looks at a little, in quite a lot of detail, and very interestingly, is the, the ways in which these debates are not just taking place within the academy, but also how it feed into popular culture and into popular science and, yeah. and into journalism and so on. Um, there's, there's a fascination outside of the academy with this kind of experimentation, this kind of um, ethology, eth- ethological yeah. um, methodology as well, isn't there, which, uh, oh, that's which marks the right. whole story, doesn't it? And in, in some ways, uh, part of uh, the background to the immediate public interest mm. in the Vervet alarm call experiments, which makes the front page of the New York Times... Mm in 1980. I mean, because, of course, at this time, the Darwinian theory is accepted in the ways that it wasn't uh, in, the, in the 19th century. But a great debate had emerged in the 1970s about animal language, thanks to these ape language experiments. And there was just the recent film about NIM, mm. uh, Project NIM, and mm. a chimpanzee ironically named Nim Chimsky uh, as a kind of salute to yeah. Noam Chomsky, who had categorically said... Animals don't do language. Language is distinctively human. So throughout the 1970s, there were, you know, one can find in in lots of children's books now, you know, these attractively hippie-ish young men and women uh, sitting cross-legged on the floor Mm. from across from from an ape, Mm. uh, teaching the ape sign language. Mm. And it's very emotionally Mm. rich, Mm -hmm. uh, the notion that at last... Humans and non-humans are reaching across the species Mm. barrier and communicating. Mm. And you get an altogether more benign notion of science than you get in the age of Agent Orange and and so forth. So it's hugely appealing. Mm. Um, But by the late 1970s, it starts to get controversial. And you begin to get descendants intellectually of Conway Lloyd Morgan coming around and saying, but are they really Mm. using language, those apes who are signing for the treats they want? Mm. Maybe they're just like the animals you see in the circus. They've been trained Mm. to get rewards, Mm. and they do what they need to do to get the rewards they want. Mm. But that's it, and that's not language. Mm. Uh, and furthermore, there's prompt. So, so um, the ape language experiments began to be criticized publicly, and the ape language experimenters took it on the whole very badly. Mm. And there emerged this public mm. disagreement, uh, mm. which of course was enormously entertaining for mm. everyone else. Mm. So all of this is happening in the pages of Time and Newsweek and the New York Times and. Uh, and at just this moment, the vervet language experiments are published. And here, one saw a very different approach. And Marler's PhD students, we should mention, Robert, I'm sorry, postdocs, uh, Robert Seifarth and Dorothy Cheney, who really become best known for this work and who actually carried out the experiments uh, in Kenya. Uh, when, when Robert in particular writes about it in a popular journal, he emphasizes the contrast between, on the one hand, the psychologists who take apes from their homes, bring them to New York City, lock them in cellars, uh, and try to instill human language, Mm. as against the ethologists Mm. who take themselves out to where the Mm. apes are and trouble themselves not to impose a language and impose a topic of conversation, but rather to try to learn what it is the animals have to say for themselves when they freely choose what they're talking about. So draws this wonderful contrast 
uh, moral, but also mm. kind of epistemic, mm. to do with knowledge mm. between these kinds of enterprises, mm. one of which is in a very public freefall, yeah. the other of which has just had this amazing success. Mm. So I think um, the public success of, the, of both experiments isn't to be taken for granted. Mm. Mm. And of course, the, the whole debate around animal language hasn't gone away. How, how, do, how do you see the debate taking shape now within the 21st century? thinking and science and practice. No, it's, it is... I mean, my book ends uh, around 1980, yeah. and it isn't the case that, that uh, research had just kind of stopped around then. Yeah. Um, in a lot of ways, the most novel innovation since that time when it comes to origin of language debates hasn't been in any of the fields that I cover in the book, uh, so not really in the study of, of animals, either ethologically or psychologically, or in archaeology or in neuroscience uh, or paleontology, uh, cognitive science. Th- those remain active and interesting, but the methods, it seems to me at least, as an outsider, remain variations on well-established mm-hmm. themes. Where you get something genuinely new mm-hmm. is uh, people... Uh, who think that they can study the origin of language by creating computer simulations right. in which they create these virtual worlds mm. and populate them with agents mm. who have properties mm. and then more or less press the return button and see what happens. Mm. And it's always interesting to go to origin of language conferences because this group in Edinburgh is a, is a real center for it uh, their papers sound very different from everyone else's. And uh, they're, it, it, it's now been going on long enough that uh, I think some integration mm-hmm. is happening. But it does seem to me that that's where the action's been mm-hmm. for a little while. Um, what I'd hoped by you know, attending those conferences as a historian of science, I'd hope to raise a little bit more of an awareness of the long-run history of this kind of scientific work because there's this uh, factoid which is unfortunately well known in the field and that is that in the 1860s the Paris Linguistic Society was constituted and in its bylaws was a prohibition on papers on the origin of language and you know you always go to these conferences and there'll be someone who talks about he puts up a slide showing the bylaw, mm-hmm. and then says, well, the prohibition's been in effect basically from then up until me. Uh, <laughs> but I'm here to show you how to be scientific yeah. about the origin of language. And one thing I'd hoped would happen uh, with the book was that people would stop saying that, uh, because it's just not the case yeah. that there was ever a pause uh, in serious and interesting scientific philosophical debate about the origins of language in evolutionary terms and also, relatedly, the question of evidence. What Mm. would count as good evidence Mm. for a scientific account Mm. of the origin of language? Uh, I'd like to think that my book has gone some way, you know, to reconstructing that story. Mm. So if that's, if I've managed that, you know, that would be an achievement. Beyond that, uh, I'd also like to think that scientific readers of the book would come away with a heightened sense of how their home disciplines can often instill in them habits of mind, questions, attitudes, which go so deep so early that they're often invisible Mm -hmm. and really rarely questioned. Mm -hmm. And history really does, I think, have a value for scientists in that it genuinely can reveal to them points of view Mm. that they wouldn't have come upon, Mm. just left to their own devices. Because often you need to go back to a time before a discipline settled down Mm. and get to hear from the people at the time who weren't already signed up to the program. Mm. Often very smart people Mm. with perceptive things to say. Mm. Uh, And uh, it's only by getting to know them and getting to know their points of view that you can become genuinely critical I mean, self-critical mm. uh, of your methods, mm. and that can be very creative. Mm. It can be subversive, but in a very creative way. 
Uh, and so I, I, uh, I should hope, and I've had at least one or two um, scientists involved in this debate for whom this seems to have worked. Um, I, I, I'd like to think that they'll come away with a richer sense of options mm. Mm. for the field mm. and for themselves than they might have had otherwise. Mm. Well, as a very non-scientific reader, I can certainly say that it was a very great pleasure to read the book and uh, to discuss it with you today. Thank you very much, Greg. My pleasure. Thank you.